Hello everybody and welcome to Sunday School. Already in Sunday School this week I have learned that sitting crisscross applesauce as a 40 year old is really painful. Uh, so I probably won't stay in this position for very long. This episode is also brought to you by Nine Square in the Air out of St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, one, because I like them and two, because I'll make Steve buy me lunch next time I'm in St. Louis. Thanks, Steve. Uh, back when we were living in St. Louis, uh, I was working at my primary office, the popular chain coffee shop uh, with, with uh, baristas that have green aprons, and one of my barista friends came over to vent a little bit. She had just taken a drive through order from her least favorite customer, uh, who was always rude, particular, ungrateful, and who happened to go to that church up the hill, uh, the church that I was employed at. Uh, for 15, 16 years. Um, so at that, at which point I had the joy of explaining that I was actually on staff at that church and I got to apologize for my sister because uh, as I told her, that's not the way Jesus lived and it's not the way that we are commanded to behave. Uh, the commands of God can feel hard, insensitive, and uh, nonsensical even in areas of life that we have created our own laws and systems that feel right to us. Emphasis on feel there. And on top of that, we feel this unspoken pressure from uh, the church and Christian community that we need to comply to these commands, commands that we don't even understand all the time, or risk losing connection with God or Christian community. That pressure has caused many in the world to reject Jesus without a second thought. And yet, if we really look at the commands of God's the commands of God, we we find them intrinsically connected to our pleasure. Our pleasure in his glory. So so slowly we begin to learn these truths, this truth as we obey that his commands are actually intended for our joy. Now, last week we looked at the first in a small list of commands in Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to read that again. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So our, our command for today is right there in verse five, and it is to be reasonable. This little command, sometimes translated, let your gentleness be evident to all, it seems to be connected to our command from last week to rejoice. It is the, the evidence, the, the overflow of a life that trusts in God's goodness and hopes in his provision and submits to his way of doing things, just like we talked about last week. Being reasonable is our natural response to God in a world spinning out of control. It's our natural response to be reasonable people, to be reasonable and gentle to the people around us. That's our natural response if we trust God. It's followed by the sobering statement, the Lord is at hand, or the Lord is near. That's sobering. In contrast to my grumpy sister in the drive-thru, uh, there's a gal in the book of Acts who seems to demonstrate this command well. So I want to I wanna read her story. This is in Acts chapter 9, <laughs> verses 36 to 43. And I've got some high-tech near flannel graph, non-flannel graph here to help us. There was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, or translated means 
Dorcas. I, w I would have stuck with, with Tabitha, but maybe it was different back then, I'm, I'm gonna assume. She was full of good works and acts of charity. Now listen, we all have ups and downs, and we're lucky if we can be defined as good people by the end of our life. But that one little statement about Tabitha says a lot about the quality of this woman. She was full of good works and acts of charity. And then she dies. In those days, she became ill and she died. And when they washed her, they laid her in the upper room And since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, or three, because I only had a picture of three, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when they arrived, they took him to the upper room. And all the widows, slightly out of focus widows, all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing him tunics, tunics and other garments that Dorcas had made. Look at these nice quality tunics that Dorcas had made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And the community of people were all there waiting and these out of focus pigs and these out of focus pigs and this nice cornucopia and this kind fellow standing at the door and for some reason Daniel and his guardian lion. <clears throat> This is, this is not actually what it says in scripture. And turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, standing on the pigs, Tabitha. And he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all of Joppa, and many believed in the land. The story of the death and coming back to life of Tabitha. So little is written about this gal that it's hard, it's hard to even know what to say. The, the passage doesn't mention wise words or great charisma, but it does talk about her sewing. And it implies that she was having such an impact in her community that they couldn't even fathom life without her. They beg God to bring her back, and he does. And probably not because her tunics rocked, uh, but because her testimony was changing the lives of her community. She was a type of person who led quietly, showing honor to all people, lifting up the poor and the weak. The whole community depended on her reasonableness. She wasn't a drive through type of gal, period. She was the type who just had to go in and see how the staff was doing, her friends. She needed to visit. She needed to encourage them, pray with them, laugh with them. She probably knew what was going on and was able to cry with them when they hurt. That's the type of girl that Tabitha or, or Dorcas was. People who make a habit of rejoicing in God are reasonable, gentle, people. And God commands us to let the world see 
our reasonableness. Why? What is it about reasonable behavior that honors God? That's a good question. Thanks for asking. There are two great commands in Sunday school. Can any of you remember, think back to Sunday school, can you remember what those two great commands are? Yes, I see those hands. Uh, the, the two great commands are as follows in this order. Number one, Jesus. Well, he's not so much a command per se, but if there's a list in Sunday school, he's got to be at the top as the answer of, to every question. And number two, the second great command is, yeah, you're right, be kind. And, and chances are good that if Jesus is not the answer to whatever question you're being asked in Sunday school, be kind will probably get you the most points. For a lot of years, I took this command of be reasonable as just that, be kind. The Lord is near, which, which kind of creates like this Santa Claus aura about Jesus. Like, uh, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. Um, being reasonable is, is definitely kind, but it's deeper than that, more profound, and absolutely critical. The book of James, in chapter 3, gives us a better picture of what it looks like to live in a reasonable way. And, and this is what our girl Dorcas figured out way before getting James's letter. So listen to James 3, 13 to 18. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And having a righteousness and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So this is like... This is down in the weeds of what it looks like to live reasonably. And the first thing I see in this passage uh, is that the reasonable, reasonable behavior is grounded in the wisdom of God. We're commanded the, to behave this way, yes. But this behavior originates, has its inspiration uh, from God's ideas his direction. This means if you want to obey this command, all you need to do is humble yourself and ask God for direction. He'll show you the opportunity and give you the ability to do it. Have you ever been the parent or the child in a go clean your room scenario? I, I've been both most recently that of the dad, obviously, and the room never ends up looking the way I envisioned when I gave the command. You know what I'm talking about? It's like they can't see exactly what I want them to see and their idea and, and my idea of what clean is, or they're just different. Uh, it, this command of being reasonable, being rooted and inspired by God's ideas and strength, this is like saying, go clean your room, and then going with the son or the daughter to instruct them, enlighten them, point things out, do the cleaning for them sometimes, and all the while celebrating joyfully. Like, he doesn't do this in, in kind of the grumpy attitude that I would have as a dad. He does this with joy and instruction like a loving, a loving father. This week... Here's an act, your first action point for this week. Ask God for an, app, for an opportunity to be reasonable to somebody. 
And then ask him for the ability to do it as well. And make notes. I was able to be kind, reasonable. Uh, what does that list say? I was, I was pure, peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Ask God for an opportunity to live that way for some, then ask him for the ability and take notes as he does it. Number two, the second thing I see in this passage, and this is scary, reasonable behavior rooted in our own desire is actually not godly. Much more than that, actually. It's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. That's intense. So why is it, in, why is it that intense? Because as we saw with Dorcas, reasonable behavior creates worship amongst the recipients. And if you or I are the subject or the theme or the inspiration of our reasonable behavior, then all we're doing is we are requesting people to give us worship. Have you ever experienced that? Have you ever done that? I, I have. I have in, in very disgusting ways, even while holding a guitar in my hand and leading worship. Just like Satan did, that, that was his entire thing before he was cast out of heaven. This is way bigger than simply be good for goodness sake. So this week, a little honest introspective. Notice how often you do good things so that you'll be noticed by other people. Then apologize to God for trying to take the worship that only he deserves. I need to do this this week as well. It's not fun, it hurts. It's all that junk that these little commands bring out like the detox that we talked about last week. The last thing I see in this passage is that reasonable behavior creates an explosion of righteousness. Imagine popping popcorn on a stove and you forget to put the lid on and it's after a little while of heating, it just starts shooting out everywhere. The fruit of your behavior seems to start small, but before long, it's exploding, spilling out all over the place. Your righteousness is growing, as is all who are blessed by your behavior. Just like Dorcas, the whole town begins to change. What if you did something crazy this week, you and some friends, to see reasonable behavior grow. Try a challenge with your family or with your friends uh, and give everyone a, a, blank, a blank card. Um, draw names out of a hat and everyone fills out their card with encouragement for someone else in the group and don't sign your names. Uh, and then discuss together how this might connect to reasonable behavior and how reasonable behavior can create a harvest of righteousness. Or, or as Jesus puts it in Matthew 5, 16, let your, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Your behavior matters. There's a direct pipeline between your behavior and the glory of God and the glory of God, and, and your joy. Let me know how it goes this week. And Sunday school will not be complete without goldfish. See you next time. Bye.